Welcome, everybody. I'd like to thank you for taking the time this evening to, to listen to this webinar. Um, this really is a story of 10 wrecks off the south coast of England, and they're all in the 40 to 60 meter mark. And it's very much uh, an opportunity to see the, the photographs that we took of these wrecks and hear the stories of the ships. This is a uh, based on the articles that were published in July and May, or May and July Scuba magazine. And there are a lot of photographs here that were submitted for publication, which, ne which never made the cut. Um, so you're getting all the photographs that we've got, uh, the best photographs that we've got of these wrecks. So the wrecks that we'll actually visit are a list here of the Dallas City, the Turlings, Ajax, Nuremberg, Y48, Luxor, Ohio, Dalesford, Saxmundham, and the Snowdrop. And then in best BBC traditions, Kathy, my wife, who sat behind here and monitoring the, the, the chat, she's going to spend a few minutes on the making of you know, the, 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 this presentation about the diving and the, the photography. And then Andy Hunt's going to close up with how you can do the same. Because obviously, at the end of the day, we're all BZAC divers, and it's BZAC that's given us the skills to do this type of diving. So we'll start with a vessel called the MV Dallas City. She was a 5,000 ton cargo carrier, uh, came over from the US, and she was sunk in July 1940. She was actually part of a convoy, OA-178. And for the convoy aficionados out there, OA is uh, an ocean going convoy. And it was A, meaning it was going from east to west. And this convoy set off in July and it was 53 ships. Norman Shotton, Shotton who was the master of the Dallas city, is recorded as saying as they went around Dungeness Point, he looked to his stern and all he could see was a line of ships looked to his bow, all he could see was a line of ships. So as you can gather, there was a, a lot of ships just mooching along the channel at between six and eight knots. And the idea was that they would be protected by the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy in 1940 was a, stretched a little bit thin. So they had one flower class corvette with just one four inch gun protecting them. This is in addition to each ship's own individual guns. They were attacked and over a period of three days, five ships were lost and 12 more damaged. At one point, they were being attacked by the, uh, the Stuka bombers and the Dallas City actually hit a ship called the Filmstrom. Um, and they were lodged together for about 15 minutes. The Dallas City herself was set alight and had three strikes actually on her. Now she was carrying something called ammonium sulfite, which if you remember last year, 2000 tons of that exploded and took out most of Beirut. So as you can gather, when she started burning, they abandoned ship. And they left her sinking off the 10 miles off Portland. She was actually found 30 miles off St. Catherine's Point, so she drifted an awful long way. For the Dallas City, one of the most memorable features of the Dallas City is the engine. Now, this is quite an important engine because it's a Duxford two-stroke, 700 horsepower diesel engine. And as you can see here, it is a massive feature. The shot line is usually placed around the, the engine. It's a large lump of metal that the, the sonar can pick up. And in fact, this is how we identified the ship. The very first time we dived the Dallas City, it was in very poor visibility. But what we did take is this one shot of the conrods um, or the, the valve gear connecting rods of the engine. We didn't think anything of the photo. It's very grainy, it's a bit, a bit overexposed, not very good photo. But this was given to Dave Wendis, who is the skipper of White Spirit. And he took it back to the Duxford engineers 
And one of the Doxford engineers looked, took one look at it and said, oh, that's the second level oiling pack walkway on cylinder number two for a, a, a marine diesel engine, which kind of added to the evidence that this was the Dallas city. So what it shows is that whatever the conditions, just get the best photograph that you can, and you, you should be able to, uh, you know, you might strike, strike it lucky. At the back of the engine, there's also a bronze flywheel. You can see that in the bottom of the photograph here that I'm highlighting. Now this flywheel weighs just under two tons, solid bronze. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful flywheel. It's never gonna come out. It's never gonna move from that position. But also within the engine, you can swim around and get to the top and look at all the valve gear. Now the valve gear on this is, it, it stands upright and it stands clear of the, 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 uh, the, the engine body itself. And you can actually see all the, the rods, the gears that would have articulated as the engine was running. And it's a great place to explore and just work out what's happening. And as you can see, this is how proud the, the valves stand. There's a nice thing about two cylinder, 700 horsepower engine. It's massive. It, it's all massive. And this is a close up of the valves and you can clearly see some of the gears, uh, the rods, which would be used to attenuate, uh, actuate the, the valves here. Now, just uh, behind the engine, or in front, yeah, behind the engine is a upright Cochrane boiler. Again, this is somewhat unique to the, to the Dallas city as the Cochrane boiler was actually fed off the exhaust gases from the engine. Now the boiler would have been used to create steam, which would have been used to heat the vessel and to drive all the winches. Being a general cargo, dry goods cargo ship, she would have had numerous winches, hoists, uh, to be able to lift bags of uh, fertilizer, bags of um, coal in and out, and, and buckets and, and whatever. So there'd be quite a large demand for steam. And then at the stern of the vessel is the steering quadrant. Now I quite like steering quadrants because they A, show you exactly which end of the vessel you're at, B, they're nice features that are usually, um, that, that, that are very clear and can usually um, aid in, in finding the rudder and the propeller. In this instance, the Dallas City steering quadrant is standing out uh, parallel to the seabed. And you can see here, if you look, there is a spring type mechanism in there, which says that the steering quadrant is quite a modern design, having some form of power assistance associated with it. The next wreck that we're going to talk about is the uh, the Turlings. So the Turlings was also part of OA178, and she was bombed and was damaged, but made it back to Southampton. And within a month, she was. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to have to reshare here. I'm afraid. Uh... <laughs> so Turlings. So the Turlings, uh, she she was part of OA one seven eight, so part of the same convoy as Dallas City. And she was travelling to Sydney in ballast, but she still needed to go down to the down the channel. And. She was turned around in Southampton within a month, repairs made, back out to work. And she was going down the channel as part of CW7, convoy CW7, channel convoy west number seven, which would go to somewhere just past the Channel Islands, and then the, uh, the vessels would all disperse. And in the early part of the uh, Second World War, this was uh, an acceptable tactic to avoid the, uh, the U-boats. And when a large number of ships would just disperse and the, um, the um, theory being that the U-boats might get one or two, but they wouldn't get many. This policy was later revised with the introduction of the convoys across the land. Um, the Turlings was actually bombed by the Luftwaffe and she took nine hits before she eventually sunk. 
and the bow is nicely on a nice shale base on the starboard side you can see the port anchor here and being so on the, on such a nice shaley bottom means you can get right up close to the anchor and have a nice good look at it i mean these anchors are 10 to 15 tons each there's also ammo boxes on the uh, the vessel here the the turnings had a small four inch gun um, uh, for self-protection um, and therefore carried a small amount of ammunition but now this ammunition is just closely guarded by inevitable conger eels. There are boilers. The boilers for the turlings are there, but they're very well buried. Now, the sharp eye might notice that at the bottom of this, there are what looks like paving slabs. These are bricks that would have been surrounding the boilers to keep the heat in. So the boilers that you see with just the metal, they would. Um, place a load of load of bricks around around there and these attract fish there's actually two boilers here and i don't think we could actually encourage enough of the fish to get out of the way to be able to take a photograph to show both both boilers and looking back at the engine the engine on this one was a three cylinder triple triple expansion engine of 180 horsepower for those that, that are particularly interested in that um, the engine is you can see the end of the engine there and some of the pipes now provide lovely homes to to conger eels the turlings when she went down um was lost eight eight men in that in that um incident and how do we know the turlings well the bell came up years ago uh just tom i've just seen your question there the turlings is in about 40 45 meters And I said earlier about the uh, the gun. The gun is clearly visible on the stern there, although the plate upright and it's on the on the sand, but it's still very very clear, very visible, and a and a cracking place to explore and have a good look at a, a British gun of that era. And finally, the um, the uh, steering quadrant um, again got a thing about steering quadrants I quite like them um, it's got the, um, uh, the, the the mechanical assistance there as well um, and the stern as you can see here the stern and the diver in there I'm in virtually all the photographs the diver with the yellow rebreather and the yellow mask is myself um, my wife Kathy took all the photographs um, and uh, the, um, the, um, the, the this is the stern here and you can see sort of the mechanisms the, the steering mechanisms at the top of the rudder were all broken out as, as she sank just moving on to the ajax now the ajax was bombed and lost slightly later again another ship bombed by the luftwaffe Interestingly, we've spoken about three Second World War wrecks and, the, and none of them have been attacked by U-boats um, during the, um, during the uh, <coughs> Second World War. The Luftwaffe and, and Schnell boats or E-boats were just as likely danger to uh, shipping in the channel as, as the U-boats were. And the Ajax here, she was part of a, another convoy quite a famous convoy where seven ships were lost called CW9 and there's probably six ships just off the uh, off the battle of off, off, the, off the South Sea um, Isle of Wight area all diveable Andy Hunt might mention that a little bit later um, but the Ajax was originally a German built ship and she changed her name three times and she was a coal carrier during the Second World War, the British needed something in the region of 40,000 tonnes a week of coal. Now, the railways couldn't ship that much coal down from the coal fields in the north, northwest and northeast um, and, and Yorkshire. 
they, they couldn't ship that volume of coal. It had to come by ships. Coming down the east coast of England was relatively safe. Coming around into the channel, they needed protection of convoys. But anyway, the Ajax was attacked by MTBs. She survived them, but eventually got struck by aircraft. Took three hits and lost four men. The bow, the idea is the, the bow is, is lying on its port side, and you can see both anchors there on the Ajax. And the nice thing about finding a bow like this that's relatively intact is you can swim around the other side and actually see all the winches. You'll see here the hawse pipes moving down where the anchor, anchor chains would go down to the anchors. They're still in place, the chains are still in place, the winches are still here. And this is a great, great place just to sort of explore all the machinery and just see, get the, the sense of the size of the ship. But the Ajax did land on a very nice sandy bottom that's, that's fairly clean and white. But it does mean that the boilers are quite well buried. Uh, and there's a winch poking out of the sand there. Again, being a collier, she would have had winches throughout the ship. Effectively, it's a, a large steel box into which they, they poured coal. And as you can see here, the conger eels have um, occupied the, uh, the, the, the ships. And the most striking feature of the Ajax is the rear steering position, which you know, stands two meters proud and is a lovely example of steering position of, the, of, that, of that era. It, it really is, really is brilliant. And finally, and I'm going to talk about why there's a motor, motorcycle photograph here, the Y48. And this is the, finally, of the, of the Second World War. The Y48 was built and rushed across the, across the Atlantic. We were building ships, the Americans were building ships at such a rate that, that a lot of them weren't, weren't, weren't even named. This one is the yard number, get it out the door. And she was a motor tanker. Um, and the um, Allies actually found her in an unsalvable, unsalvageable condition. We don't know why, we, whether this was she just broken up due to bad weather poor construction or whether the enemy action happened. Don't even know if there were any men on the, on the ship. I presume there was men on the ship. Um, but she was a motor tanker and there's a number of hatches on the motor tanker which had pipes attached to it, which indicate that it, it was a tanker. Um, how do we I know it was the Y-48? Well, a, a ship of roughly that size Type was reported lost or sunk by the Allies at, at that point. So it's got evidence points to it on that. Worryingly, there's the, the porcelain has managed to survive the um, survive the sinking. This one's in about 60 meters. And despite Kathy's best efforts, we still couldn't get it clean. I'm going to get thumped for that one now. <laughs> um, but there are plates and crockery available on here it's all very it's a very new ship it was very clean ship no, there's nothing of any any indication but as you come up to the forecastle you'll see just to the stern of the forecastle is the spare anchor and th th this is on the starboard side and it you know it just shows that they were just throwing these ships together putting the spare anchor in as near as they could to the, to the, to the bow of the ship now on the port side in the forecastle is a motorbike Quite clearly, it's, it's a motorbike. I'm going to zoom in on it. And I see that there's been some debate about whether it's an Indian, a Harley, or a, an, another type of motorcycle. I'm afraid I'm not a motorcyclist. But it's there. But what the interesting point is, I mean, it's, it, it's well corroded, the forks have gone, etc. Is what it shows is that the, the Americans that came over were intent on seeing a bit of Europe. And this was probably very undocumented. It was either the captains or the chief engineers or one of the very senior officers who could smuggle a motorcycle 
onto the vessel and then take it for a ride when they get back, um, get, get near land, near France or into the UK. Really interesting idea as to why it was there, probably needs a lot of investigation and a motorcycle aficionado could tell us which type it was and the twin, et cetera, but I'm a bit more of a, a steam engine buff. And the propeller as well, you can see it's a very cheaply constructed uh, propeller and, and rudder system there. Why it, why it sank, we don't know. So moving on to between the wars, SS Nuremberg or SMS Nuremberg. Now she's a Conic class, class light cruiser. I know there's quite a lot of people here on, on the webinar and there's a, probably a high percentage who have dived the Conig in Scapa Flow. Nuremberg was a Scapa Flow wreck. She was sunk in June 1918, raised during 1819. Um, and, you know, the whole story of, of Scapa, she's probably the most southern diveable wreck from Scapa that there is. There is another one in about 180 metres down Alderney Way, but I think I'm going to call this the, uh, the southernmost diveable, diveable Scapa flow wreck. And finally, she was actually towed down to the course and towed out into the channel. And for the lucky few that had dived the HMS Repulse, she was a target practice for Repulse. And Repulse rapid fired, hit 30, hit she, the Nuremberg took 30 shells from the Repulse before she started to sink, nine of which were at or below the waterline. So when you go down, you can see that she's very broken up, very battered. This is the hawse pipe from the bow. Um, the, the top section of the bow is broken off and the, the hawse pipe has survived. The capstan, so on the, on the bow, there would have been two capstans to actually haul the anchors in. The, uh, the, the, the Royal Navy ships and the, the German Navy ships didn't use winches, they used capstans. And, uh, these would have been at deck level, and as the ship collapsed down, the capstans were, capstans were pushed up and the decks have collapsed round, making a very clear and very obvious feature of, of the bow. And if you look carefully in the next photograph of the guns, there are the capstans again, so you can always orientate yourself. Now, 1922, the British had loads of guns. We had no need for guns. So when the Nuremberg was sunk, she still had all her guns in place. Um, and here you can see a fine example of two of their guns, not quite in firing condition, but certainly there. And you can even swim round. And if you dare take on the uh, Congreal hiding in the breach, have a look in the breaches of the, uh, the guns. There are boilers in place. And obviously the scapa flow, the conic wreck is relatively intact. This one was beaten, beaten by the repulse. So it's all very broken and, and very opened up. And at the stern, you can actually see the propeller. There's um, three propellers from memory on this, on this vessel, but you can see just to the left of the propeller here, the rudder has been bent up by the force of the impact. But these are very high speed uh, propellers designed to drive this ship very quickly. I think the, the Conigs did about 25, 26 knots, which for 1918 was very rapid. So moving on to the First World War, we, we, we come across a wreck called the Ohio. She was 13 and a half thousand tons, sunk in October 18, and she was actually sunk by a collision with another vessel called the SS Lady Plymouth. And this is quite an unusual story is the fact is that, you know, during 1918, the convoys would be formed, they'd be traveling down the, uh, the channel, and they wouldn't have lights on. The only time they'd show lights is when they heard another vessel uh, very, very close proximity, then they very quickly flash a light just to say, look, red, green, I'm here, you move, you know, wh whatever, whatever rules that were, you know, depending on where the vessel is. And Ohio hit Lady Plymouth, Ohio went down, I believe Lady Plymouth survived. But what happened in subsequent investigations, it transpired that 
two convoys crossed each other. So it's actually a feat of amazing, amazing seamanship that only one collision where we've got two large convoys crossing each other. Looking at the bow here, the Ohio, it's a very, very broken shipwreck. You can see the anchor here, and as you can see, it's much more of an admiralty type anchor here. The uh, for those that's the anchor, and that's the stock. Yeah, very much a traditional admiralty type anchor. <coughs> this is a shot of the boilers, a bit of an overhead shot of the boilers. Now this was taken as we were ascending, and Kathy's going to talk about how how to get this type of shot uh, a bit later. But it gives you that nice overview of two boilers and, and how they're, they're lined up. And as a divers, we had to go and have a look. And we don't always, you know, we, we do dive as a team. So there could be times when there's two, three of you on a particular feature. And it's just a case of gathering as much information as you can. Because the Ohio hasn't actually been positively identified. We know roughly where it went down, but due to the size, the shape, the configuration of the engine, it's a two cylinder compound engine on its side. You'll see that in a second. Um, you know, it's the most likely wreck. It's a probability thing. And in fact, this is the, the engine here. And you can see the, um, the rocker arm mechanism for the valves here. The engine's actually on its side. And then over on the stern, to the back side of the engine, the valve here as well. So these, these engines do break um, and, and collapse. Moving on to the Luxor. Sorry. 1,300 tons. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, uh, the Luxor um, was, uh, <coughs> is our first and only ship sunk by a U-boat in the channel uh, we're talking about tonight. She was part of the Moss Line. Now, the Moss Line in 1918 or 1914 offered up and all of their ships for government service. This was taken on and unfortunately the Moss Line did particularly badly out of World War I and all but two of their ships were lost. This brought the Moss Line down to it down to a financial means and it was eventually taken over by Royal Mail shipping line and eventually P&O in 1935. Now, why do I mention the Moss Line? Well, the Moss Line is quite key to the, uh, the identification of this wreck. But she was torpedoed and obviously sank. Now, again, the anchor here is a nice Danforth type anchor produced. It's sort of a transition period, the First World War. And when you get an anchor like this in about 50 odd metres, you always go behind it and look for the pile of chain to the stern, just rear of the, of the anchor. There's always a chain locker where the chain has to be stored, and this usually survives the rigors of time and tide. And it also provides a wonderful hunting ground for lobsters and crabs. The boilers on this ship are, are clearly visible, but the um, engine isn't and between the engine and the and the stern there's a there, there's a prop shaft but not a lot else there's a lot of sheets of metal it's basically these are boxes between the engine and the, and the and the prop on the stern here you will notice there is a gun just down here so she was armed with a a small four inch four inch gun as you can see here i've just fired off my um uh, fired off my SMB, and you know, Kathy's still taking photographs. But when you've got visibility like this, you you take every opportunity you can. Moving on to the uh, Dalesford. So the Luxor is in a fifty meters, fifty fifty two meters. So the steamship Dalesford was 
lost in 1911. And she was actually full of coal traveling to Spain. And moving down the channel, for those of you that have dived in the channel or dived out at distance out at sea, thick fog can be a major problem. And she was in collision with a Russian schooner called the Pulin, who was carrying uh, wood. Uh, and very quickly, the master of the Dalesford realized that uh, his ship was beyond repair. And all the crew managed to um, climb from the Dalesford into the Pulin before the Dalesford sank. And I think she went down within about 15, 20 minutes. But the Pulin itself was badly damaged. And so the crew were transferred over to another vessel. And whereabouts of the pool in now? Afraid we don't know that. Um, but the Dalesford, obviously, we managed to shot and have a look around the boiler. Boilers there, and it's got two impressive boilers. Um, and these feel, feed a two cylinder compound engine of about 175 horsepower. Now this one stands up really clear and it's you can actually see all the con rods um you can see all the, the mechanisms and for the svelte of you and with a rebreather and stages i'm not particularly svelte underwater you could potentially swim through the uh through the engine um but uh you can see here you know there's a lot of life on here and this, these engines are impressive, mainly be a sort of 175 horsepower. In massive amount of torque. And for the uh, aficionados, a lobster here, we found a lobster just walking about uh, out for his lunch and we decided to leave him. <laughs> so he could just stay there and enjoy his lunch and didn't become a lunch. Being a, a collier, there are winches all over the Dalesford. Um, again, you know, she, she would have had used these winches for uh, um, <clears throat> I'll mention the uh, the diving shop in the um, it, we'll mention where to go to dive these wrecks a little bit later. Um, you know, there's winches all over and towards the stern and we know this is the, towards the stern because we've we've explored both bow and stern but this was definitely towards the stern uh one of the spare anchors again an admiralty type pattern here you can see um and it's a spare anchor because it's not attached to anything and a steering quadrant now one feature to notice on this steering quadrant this is a ship from the uh 19, 19 1800s uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, there's no mechanical assistance. So the poor old helmsman would be relying on the uh, the gearing of his, his wheel and being able to pull the chain all halfway up the vessel to be able to maneuver the vessel. And the propeller here. Now, if you look at the propeller here and compare it to the, um, um, yeah, the, the, no visible cog teeth, yeah, it, it could well have been a, um, a rope, rope steering. The, um, the propeller here is much larger than the propeller we saw on the on the Nuremberg, much deeper pitch. So this would have been a long, slow propeller to chug along at eight knots. That's all that was needed for a vessel like this. Now, the, the key thing about this one is how did we identify the Dalesford? Well, there was all the roughly the known ship, right position, etc. But the bell was recovered. Now all the right paperwork has been and was completed for this. So uh, appropriate uh, receiver before the you had to get a license and uh, appropriate receiver of wreck has been informed. Uh, and I will say that BZAC does not condone the uh, removal of artif artifacts. However, on the left you can see the bell that was brought up from a dive on the Dalesford, and then Julian managed to polish it, put a lot of time and effort into that, and it has come up absolutely beautifully. But we know for a fact that is the Dalesford, and she was built in 1882. 
So <clears throat> moving on, we come to a wreck and the, the cover shot of the, the scuba article and the entry shot for this deck was both of the engine of the Saxmundham. And as you can see here, there are days when it, you're mid channel and we're just inside the shipping lane here. You can see in the background there, the, some ships in the shipping lane. It was flat calm, absolutely beautiful day. And we do only go out here this far when it is safe to do so, obviously guided by, uh, by the skipper. She was, <clears throat> but the conditions were a lot, lot worse in November 19, 1888. It was horrendously bad weather. Um, you know, st stormy seas, raining, and the, the Saxmundham collided with a, a schooner called the Nor. The Nor was carrying coke and coal. The Saxmundham was a two masted schooner with five winches. And the description says extra large donkey boiler. And she sank in 10 minutes. Um, I don't have any names for the, um, the, the survivors, numbers for the survivor. And she was ID'd by uh, details of the steering gear, uh, some of the numbers from the steering gear. But the Saxmundham went down quickly, and we've got the bow here. Now, this is a particularly interesting bow shot because the the bow is at a funny angle. The main body of the wreck is where Kath's taking the photograph from. You can see the bow sort of broken up. <clears throat> and just to our, our right, just off, ship, off shot, is, is a large reef. So it shows that there must have been some forces, the quite, quite heavy forces, when, when the Saxmundham landed in there. And this, this is a lovely shot of the bow. Being a schooner, she would have had sails, and there is evidence of the sailing, say, of her being a sailing ship with, with dead eyes on the, on the um, gunnels. You can see here the boilers and the extra large donkey boiler here. And just to my left, on the right hand side of the shot, is, is that donkey boiler. And you can see in the background here, there's the top of something very interesting. It's the engine. And you can see here the steam collection device and the, the, the engine here. Now, for those of you, to give you a perspective, the diver at the bottom there is in about 60 meters. He's in 60 meters. I set my SMB off from the top of the engine and I was in 52 meters. That's eight meters high. And this is a two, two cylinder, 300 horsepower compound engine. This is one of the most impressive engines I've seen underwater. It's absolutely stunning. You can swim easily through it. This is the cover shot they used for scuba. You can see the, the back, the, the stern of the engine. You can have a look in and you can see all the mechanisms, the, the rods, the gears and everything that, that, that operate at that, that section of the engine. And swimming round, you just get that that sense of this is a major piece of 18, 1800s engineering. It's a quality, quality engine. Top of the engine, you can see all the valve gear here. Now these would have been covered in light um, steel or, or copper or brass, but it's, it's long since either rusted away or been action of wind and tide has, has, has taken it away. And then I think this is one of another one of our my favourite shots here is we swam down the to the stern to have a look at the the, the stern and and that's pretty buried so there's no no rudder and, and steering it here um, or no <coughs> no rudder down there but you can see here this is the drive shaft the engine and in the background the boilers we had a very special day when we dived this one, this wreck. Um, we got some stunning visibility. Um, and now I'm going to come on to the, 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 final, the final wreck here, um, is SS Snowdrop. Now, 1886, there aren't that many pictures of vessels of that era. 
and given it's been cold and snowy and I know some of so, some of us in Berkshire have had absolutely no snow and uh, I know some colleagues uh, on the east coast have had lots and Staffordshire's had lots uh, I'm quite jealous but some snowdrops she was a relatively small six seven hundred ton vessel um, carrying coal she left Dover and was never seen again we don't know how she sank or why she sank how was she found well the navy and the coast guard have um uh, yeah, th 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 thank you <laughs> sussex has had snow as well uh, the navy have surveyed most of the channel and identified lots of anomalies and i think at some point during the uh, the 90s or the early 2000s this anomaly was dived and the um, steering boss was recovered and the uh, the wreck a position identified and b the uh, the wreck identified as well um, but the snowdrop here has a, a wonderful boiler with a large collection steam collection device and the inevitable winches and an engine um, I think it's a, a compound engine and again you can see all the, the they didn't put safety gear around all these um, these engines they just left it all open why put extra weight on when you don't need to and this th this engine here is really a, a good example of, of an engine of that era and you can see here the boiler with its steam collection device in the in the background and then just to one side of the engine, you can see another steam collection device or, or condenser um, ju just on the other side of the engine. And there is loads to explore on the snowdrop. I quite like the name of the vessel. I, I find it an interesting vessel to dive. You've got the prop shaft going, <coughs> going from the, the engine down to the, the, the stern and the rudder. And again, you've got the rudder there with a, a nice simple propeller again this this vessel was a chugger not, not a not a not, not, not a uh, not a speedster and this one is in about 58 meters i'm now going to hand over so i'd just like to say massive thanks to to dave wendis who is the skipper of white spirit so all the diving was actually done off white spirit and he's also very interested in wrecks and he's written two books ship south coast shipwrecks and supplements the south south coast shipwrecks where he's done a lot of the research uh that, that's been presented here tonight the other book that i've used is a book called the coastal convoys uh, 1939 to 45 and it's probably one of the most unex you know untold stories is, is the convoys up and down the channel we know about the convoys across the uh, across the atlantic but not up and down the channel and finally to the dive team and i know some of them are actually on on the uh on the presentation tonight but uh the you know with dave and julian they've put together a great team uh diving out out of limington with with white spirit and uh you know just thanks to the team i'm now going to hand over to kathy and uh, i'm going to pick up on the uh the chat so do excuse us quick seat swap here oh. Right. So I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes um, about some of the background uh, to this talk. Um, OK, just looking at the diving side of it. And yes, that is me not looking very elegant, just having got out the water. Um, just like other divers, we've moved from single cylinders to twin sets. And for the last 10 years, we've been diving with Inspiration XPD rebreathers. Um, someone did ask a question about what gases we use. It does depend very much um, on the wrecks that we're diving, but anything from air or tri-mix down to uh, 1050 mix. Like most technical divers, uh, we prefer hard boats that have lifts. Um, I can't manage a ladder with the rebreather, two bailout cylinders and the camera. Um, all that equipment is nearly 70 kilos and there's no way I'm getting up a ladder with an extra 70 kilos. Um, 
the team chooses to use uh, DSMB ascents rather than using a trapeze. Uh, this way we can explore further in the limited time that we have on the wrecks rather than having to return to a shot line. It's just the way we prefer to dive. Um, and I can actually use that to my advantage as John can then set his DSMB up from the wreck and I can take shots looking down on the wreck on the way back up. Um, and we did show you one of those shots um, earlier in the presentation. And then I can send my bag up uh, later. Um, the hard boat that we use, as John mentioned, is based out of Lymington. Um, and as John's already mentioned, it comes with a skipper who's interested in wreck research. And that is actually, that really helps um, because you can actually talk about the history of the wrecks. Um, and it's not just a dive. It then comes with a story and, and a history, which to my mind makes it a much, much more interesting uh, dive. The team that we've that, that have been put together. Um, we're also happy to do undived sites. Um, so you don't know what you're going to get until you get to the bottom. Um, so a dive like this could be anything from a large piece of pipe to an, a completely um, undived wreck. But if you're doing that, you have to be prepared to do a 50, 60 metre dive on possibly a pile of rocks. Um, but that's part of the adventure. So now quickly looking at the photography. Um, Dom, Dom, Dom Robbins has just asked about run times and decoupling. Could you cover that while you're talking about the diving? <laughs> right, so uh, run times, we tend to uh, stick to usually about an hour and a half run time. On the deeper wreck, so 60 metre wreck, it'll be sort of 20 minutes, half an hour on the bottom and the rest will be deco. Again, it depends very much on the depth of the wreck. Um, the time of year, so the temperature of the water. I, I, I'm a wimp and I don't do cold. Um, back to photography. Um, right, I use, for those people who are interested, I use a Nikon D610. It's in an Aquatica housing and I have a 16mm fisheye lens. And you can see the picture on the right is me with my wee beastie. Uh, most of the photographs are actually taken using natural light. Um, and then I tend to use Photoshop Channel Mixer to put some of the natural colour back in again, rather than having them totally green or blue. Um, I use manual settings, and most of the pictures that John's presented were taken at between a 25th to a 30th of a second shutter speed. Uh, F-stops are between 2.8 and 4.5, and an ISO between about 1,000 and three and a half thousand. So anyone interested, those are the, the numbers that go with the photographs. Um, someone did ask a question about the torch. So the light that was used by my glamorous model in some of the photographs is actually an anchor light, 189, which is otherwise known as an audacious. Um, since about 2019, I've started to use two anchor crook lights instead of flash guns. Um, I haven't done a huge amount with them yet, as let's face it, last year was a bit of a write-off. Um, so I've still got a lot of experimenting to do with my photography. And that's it for me. Um, and now I believe it's over to Andy Hunt. Yes. Um, well, good evening, folks. Uh, I think John's going to do the slides for me. Um, he uh, asked me about a month ago if I'd just um, finish up and uh, answer the question, how can you do the same, basically, or how you can do the same? And uh, my initial response was actually that's quite a long topic and probably the subject of a series of lectures. Um, but the short answer is there's a book. Um, so if you hit the space key now, John, it should appear. So the, the, the short answer is read the manual. Um, the, the BSAC expedition manual is now probably written just over 10 years ago. Um, and, and that contains um, a range of case studies um, that will suit the weekend warrior uh, up to major tech trips. So we actually cover um, a, a case study on diving HMEPS Victoria. Uh, which uh, lies in 150 metres of water in the Mediterranean. So if you just click on the next thing a bit. Um, and just listening to Jono and Cathy as they've gone through their talk, um, a couple of things uh, uh, 
has struck me. One is that uh, they say that they're not used to cold water diving. There's a, a little slide coming up at the end that proves that they do venture into the cold. Um, so that's coming up. But what's important, I think, sometimes about these dives is the narrative, the story behind them. It just adds another element. And uh, what I found when we wrote the expedition manual is there's, there's a lot of really good stories that uh, draw you into these dive sites and just add a, another dimension so it doesn't become just another wreck. It, there's, there's a bit more to it than that. So um, just to fill out the time now, I thought, well, uh, rather than just sort of plug a manual, um, what did the dive team say? What did Jono's dive team say? So I, I, I drew up a, a little straw poll um, questionnaire, and uh, it, it, I, I don't know who came. I, it was all anonymized, so um, but I, I got some quite interesting uh, answers. And um, so I'll just run through from from top to bottom. So the first question was, how old were you when you started diving? And the average age was 23, 21 and three quarters. The how long have you been diving? Um, the average was 33 and three quarters. So if you do the maths, they're all probably in the mid 50s. Um, and then the other one was, how long have you been technical diving? And uh, the the. Uh, well, that was a bit more hit and miss because there was a, a bit of debate on what you call technical diving. Uh, anyway, just as, a, as it's only a straw poll, the average was about 20 years there. So what you have in terms of the dive team is, some, is, is a team that's very experienced. Um, they've been doing a lot of, I guess, what you would call nowadays recreational diving, maybe up onto the run, run up to sort of doing the technical stuff. But if you look at the overall timescales, this is a group of divers who have grown up with technical diving, uh, which which started to really sort of grow in the in the nineteen nineties and make some of these sites uh, accessible. So that was some basic numbers. Uh, I then sort of went a little bit more philosophical <laughs> and maybe political, and and asked, well, you know, how did you get into the dive team? Were you invited? Um, so. Uh, you know, one of the answers got I got back was I set up the dive team. I thought, okay, well, that's clearly the expedition leader. leader. Uh, but then the the, the, the the team are really formed by sort of invitation and recommendations. So clearly there's a lot of diving going on outside and people sort of get together and, you know, you, 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 there's a bit of word of mouth and this team somehow coalesces together. Uh, into a, a, a you know a, a, a group, and I think there was a, a core team of maybe around four people making it happen, and then you have people sort of coming in out of this group as and when they can fit in the diving uh, uh, around their lives. Um, so I thought, well, that's that's sort of interesting. What makes this diving more special than just another random shuttle boat? Because you know, there's there's. You know, you can go as a buddy pair uh, and do some great diving off shuttle boats. And it, what I found in response to that question was as it was the camaraderie that you had with this group who, who get to know each other over time. There's a greater trust. People know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And, um, uh, you know, another key thing, just from the diving point of view, if you've got that collective group on a on a bit of a collective mission you have a greater say in really where the boat is going to go so there's a, a key advantage there in coming together of a group in that you can you well you've got more negotiating power with the skipper I guess to tell him where you would like to go um, then I thought well okay well how do you vet uh, new team members and I'll probably cover this already I, I, it generally the expedition leader really got personal recommendations from other team members uh, uh, and as I've mentioned before, that it's implicit that clearly, you know, as you dive and you're trying to get into maybe a team or do this sort of diving, then people will be properly watching you, how you dive underwater. Um, so the, the, the third um, set of questions is a, is a little bit more, I guess, um, BSAC related, I guess. Um, but the first one I started was, was do you think your pre-deep dive diving experience has made you a better deep diver and and it was a, a pretty emphatic yes I think um, you know some of the comments to that were paper qualifications are not no substitute for for experience you know a lot of that shallow water diving there were mistakes made and you you, you know people got away with it because it was quite shallow but it formed 
you know, the, the foundations for all the other stuff. And, and a lot of the people saying it's about the journey to, to get there as well. And it was almost like there's no shortcuts to that. Um, the Then I thought, well, OK, let's get really political now. And so what does advantages does the BSAC system uh, offer uh, and, and that sort of BSAC community? And, and it, again, um, you know, I got a response saying it, it provided that firm framework to build on. Uh, and, and that's, you know, the team hadn't just done BSAC stuff. They'd looked outside that uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, some have done qualifications in other organizations. And but that, that underpinning thing about this, there's something about that network and system uh, has been an advantage in this case. Um, and then I asked, OK, well, OK, what's your best top tip? Um, for someone uh, interested in doing diving like this. And, um, you know, again, got a range of um, answers, but the, the theme is really dive, 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 you know, build up experience in a range of conditions progressively and, and don't rush uh, rush to, to depth. And, and I think over the course of this presentation, you've probably seen photographs from a range of depths uh but there's you know especially off the back of the isle of Wight, there's there's a lot of them aren't desperately deep there's sort of a nice little sweet spot uh you know maybe sort of 40 meters you know it's sort of entry level trimix down to sort of 50 60 meters uh that you can get you know really good sort of deeper dives but without really having to hang around uh, mid-water too much to avoid all the uh the shipping traffic so um so just next slide, please. You can, John. Um, so just again, it's just this is trying to look forward to, to think. Well, how can BSAC help you if you're not a diver into who's who are in, who's into this already, and you're thinking about progressing into stuff? How can the organisation help you? So, I think if you just hit the space key now and get all the answers up, it's probably easier, Jono. So. So I think, you know, BSAC provides a framework for going diving. Uh, for most people, that starts with a branch. You know, you build that experience by going diving and actually organizing the expeditions going diving. Can you get a huge amount of experience from that, especially when the buck stops with you, you start to look at things in a completely different light. Um, there's that wider community and network. And as you can see on the call, there's been up to sort of, like, sort of over 170, 180 people on the call tonight. There's that network there. Uh, of like-minded divers and that's very useful if, if you're, you're in a branch that doesn't really have critical mass to get together to do this sort of diving um, but um, you know there's there's other things that we're trying to organize uh, I guess as an organization um, now just before COVID kicked in we managed to start to, to roll out some of those um, last year uh, the year before last week we, we um, ran the scaffold 100 and then there was a Normandy 75 expedition running uh, there was also some tech trips tech trips uh, just before COVID we did an advanced diver weekend up in the Sound of Mall uh, so if you just click on space now a couple of times Jono If you're still there. Sorry, Andy, I was talking on mute. There was a question <laughs> about um, which I think everyone might be might be interested in is how do you go about building a dive team and training up for these more complex dives? Um, oh, right. OK. Um, I, th I think it, it's coming back to sort of this progressive thing. Um, th it, it, it there's training courses you can do uh, that sort of gives you if you like a baseline um, I, you, you can then sort of do diving and I, and I think that is trying to sort of get form a group to sort of build up progressively I think is a good way um, and um, I, I think from an organization point of view we're trying to create those possibilities to to enable those teams to form um, so I know you know, a lot of BSAC events, whether they're instructor events or even first class events or even technical events, but they, they you get a group of people coming together, doing a course together. And they sometimes actually then form groups and go off and do that sort of diving um, to, together. Um, so that would be one <laughs> one answer to that question. 
Okay, so th thanks, Andy. <laughs> I just thought it was pertinent at that point. <laughs> yep. You could out. I think I'm almost at the end now. I need to get to your picture. Um, so um, I, I thought I'd throw this in there so I can probably almost hear the groans from people who've been on the instructor training course at, at this point. There is this classic uh, iceberg analogy, you know, the bit uh, out the surface. Uh, if you hit the space bar a couple of times, Jono, it, it, you know, the, you've got the, the diving bit uh, and then underneath that there's a lot of planning, preparation. I'd also say maybe people um and perseverance so um and and you know in in the com in in that sort of straw poll survey idea it, it, it seemed to draw out that you know this is you know this deeper diving happens you know with effort it doesn't happen by chance um so anyway i must conclude uh, i've got a few words to finish off and also i uh, promised you a picture of um uh, Jono in the cold, and I'm pretty sure that's Cathy taking the, the photograph. So that's what a real iceberg uh, looks like. <laughs> it, yeah, it, that, that is us and an iceberg. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, just in, in, in terms of uh, the uh, last words to try and summarise, you know, and, and answer that question, there's, there's no real shortcuts for deeper diving. Um, it, it requires experience, it requires training, preparation, practice. Uh, and actually the the you know that that element called people so back to you Johnny. okay that's great thanks andy and and, and uh, thank you for all the, the the positive comments that have been coming in on the on the chat we we've been monitoring that